Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Family Caregiver Support Program a weekly training and education session. My name is Michelle McGuire. I'm a case manager with the Family Caregiver Support Program. Before I move on, I'd like to introduce the rest of the S FCSP team. Amy Blackburn is our program manager, and the other case managers are Olga Yamawaki and Valerie Moreno. This week's topic is family caregiving research or research in family caregiving. Basically what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna to touch on a couple different types of research. I'm gonna look at research ethics. I'm also gonna talk about caregiving research over time, kind of the evolution of family caregiving research. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you can participate in family caregiving research. So to start, basically research at its most basic is three steps. You ask a question, you collect information or data to answer your question, and then you present your answer or your solution to the question. That's it, that's research in a nutshell. But we can blow it out too and get real detailed. We can break it down into two basic types of research. I shouldn't, two types of research, basic and applied. Basic is uh, to acquire knowledge for the sake of knowledge. It answers what, why, or how. And one example would be um, our computers today, they wouldn't exist without the basic science of math that was done centuries ago. And that's the same with uh, anatomy and physiology. The basic science that was done centuries ago has informed the med medical science that we have now. And applied research, that's used to solve practical problems. For example, improving energy efficiency in homes, treating or curing diseases, decreasing traffic congestion, et cetera. Now, clinical research is a branch of healthcare science that determines the safety and effectiveness of medications, devices, and diagnostic products. And the reason I bring it up is it's probably most relevant to family caregivers. And one part of clinical research is clinical trials, which you probably heard a lot about. What are clinical trials? They're basically studies. They're trial runs. Why do we do them? To evaluate the effectiveness and safety of new medications or medical devices. Basically, it's the trial runs of those studies, right? And how is it done? By monitoring the effectiveness on groups of people. Basically, people are randomized into a different arm or a group of the study. You can be group A and get the new drug. You can be in group B and not get the new drug. That's it in a nutshell. Now the first clinical trial is said to have been um, recorded in the Bible about 500 BC. There was a king whose name, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce. He ruled Babylon for about 60 years. And allegedly one day he ruled that all of his subjects should have a diet of only meat and wine. And some of his subjects were like, hey, you know, we like vegetables. We don't want to do this. So he says, okay, you guys eat your vegetables. Everybody else eat meat and wine and we'll compare you in six months. And this is allegedly the first recorded clinical trial. So how are clinical trials done? I'm sure you've heard of the phases. There's actually five phases of clinical trials, zero through four. And phase zero is how a drug is processed in the body. That's the goal, that was what they're looking at, how it affects the body. It's never been given to humans before at phase zero. So basically you're gonna see what happens if we give it to a person now. And this is, it's a small dose is given. And it's only used on 10 to 15 people. Now, if this is a device, I'm not sure how they do the small dose, maybe. <laughs> Maybe they just use a, maybe if it's an electrical current, they're just using a very small amount of current. Or if it's an implanted device, maybe they just implant it in a very benign area of the body. But basically phase one is just kind of introducing the new thing and just see how it affects people. If you don't kill them, you get to go to phase one. Phase one tries to determine the best dose with the fewest side effects. And again, you're just looking at a small group of people, maybe 10 or 15 people. And you can go through phase one, you can stay there for a while and you're gonna be running multiple studies because you're gonna be slowly increasing your dose and watching those side effects to see the strongest, most effective dose with the fewest side effects. Phase two, you're looking at targeting a condition. 
and you're going to employ larger groups of people. Let's say you have a medication for diabetes. You may have 50 people in group A that get your new drug, 50 people in group B don't get the drug, for example. Very simplified example, but you get the point. Phase three, <clears throat> excuse me, phase three compares your new treatment to the standard treatment if there is one. And for FDA approval, you must pass through phase three. And phase three usually employs hundreds of people with multiple arms or multiple groups in the study. So again, once you pass phase three, you've got your FDA approval. Once you have FDA approval, you can do what is called phase four, which is also referred to as the safety stage or safety study. And this is when it's rolled out to thousands of people or several hundreds of people. Um, and they're looking for bigger overall kind of research. They're looking for rare side effects that they didn't pick up in the previous phases. They're looking at um, long-term comparisons of treatments with other drugs or other conditions. Uh, yeah, so they're looking more at the big picture in phase four. And again, that's called a safety study. So that's it for clinical trials. And you might hear a lot if you're um, looking at caregiving research, there is quite a bit of clinical trials um, in the medical aspects of it. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna move on now to a little bit about research ethics. Excuse me, excuse me. A little bit about excuse me. That was a nice break. <clears throat> so research ethics are basically guidelines for conducting and monitoring research to ensure participant safety. And there's five principles of research ethics. Minimize the risk of harm to the participants obtain informed consent, protecting participants' anonymity and confidentiality, avoiding deceptive practices, and providing the right to withdraw. And there's a reason, there's a reason that research ethics developed over time, and that is because historically, scientists have not necessarily treated their human subjects all that well. And we first, um, the first attempt to protect human subjects was something called the Nuremberg Code in 1947. It was basically a document and it defined standards for treatment of human subjects in research. And this came about, it came out of the Nuremberg trials, which was when the Nazis were put on trial for uh, war crimes in World War II. <clears throat> and the information that came out about how they treated people in the name of science uh, was the cause for this code to be developed. Basically, uh, you know, they were treating people very badly and um, the international community realized we need to protect people. So in the United States, we really were suffering from a lack of informed consent, meaning that people didn't necessarily know that they were being studied or um, in a research study or that something was being done to them. And yeah, there's a lot of examples. I just hit a few here, the most famous ones. Um, for example, the Tuskegee syphilis study started in 1932. And I'm really sad to report that that went on for 40 years. It went on to 1972. And the Tuskegee uh, syphilis study basically employed 600 African-American men. They were infected with syphilis and they didn't know it. They were not informed of the study. And to make matters worse, they were not informed when the treatment was found. When penicillin was found to be effective against syphilis, they were not informed and they were not given the treatment. Very unethical. Uh, Willowbrook, 1956. Mentally ill children were intentionally infected with hepatitis. And this went on for 14 years. The Fernald State Study state school trial, sorry, radioactive materials were fed to handicapped children to test for min mineral absorption. The Jewish chronic disease case of 1964, older Jewish individuals were injected with cancer cells to study the immune response. So good intentions of these researchers wanting to help and solve problems, but treating people very poorly in the, in the meantime. 
1965, this started to come to light and the National Institute for Health um, started requiring a human subjects review panel. And what this was, was an, they wanted to have an ethics review by an impartial panel of peers for every research study that involved humans. Problem was it was informal, it wasn't enforced. It was like a recommendation or a suggestion. It took until 1974, two years after Tuskegee ended, till 1974 for the Department of Health and Human Services to pass federal regulations requiring the Institutional Review, review Board review and also informed consent for every single research study involving humans. Now an Institutional Review Board is a committee, a formal committee or body um, that is, I wanna say housed within an institution. For example, every school, every college has its own IRB board. Um, most of the companies I work for have their own IRB department and it's heavily regulated again by federal, federal regulations. Um, and they will review your research studies very closely for any kind of human protections necessary and also to look at your informed consent. So both of those things are required now to conduct human subjects research and it's done to protect the participants. So this informed consent we talk about, it's huge. And that's probably some of the biggest problems with those research studies that I mentioned, the Tuskegee and the uh, Willowbrook was that the people were not informed that, that things were being done to them, that they were being infected and that they were part of research studies. And so informed consent, you need to inform your participants and they need to consent say it's okay. And informed consent, a document must include a list of participants' rights, which there are like 10 of them. Um, the purpose of the study, the procedures, the potential risks and benefits, the fact that participation is voluntary and you can leave at any time for any reason, and also that vulnerable populations get extra protection. And a vulnerable population is just that, a person who is more vulnerable, let's say you're sick, you're a prisoner, you're a child, you're pregnant, um, maybe you're just a little more vulnerable than the general population. You get extra protections. So I'm gonna jump now into kind of the evolution of research in the field of caregiving. So what is caregiving research? It's basically the collection, organization, and analysis of information to increase our understanding of a topic or issues related to family caregiving. And that's from the Family Caregiving Alliance, got the website there. It's a fantastic website for anybody who's a, a caregiver. So why is caregiving research important? Well, it adds to our knowledge. It adds to our knowledge about what's going on with caregivers and caregiving so that we can understand problems and strengths, areas of challenge and also successes. It improves practice because it provides information on how well treatments or care are working and how they could improve. And it informs policy. For example, the earliest version of the Family Medical Leave Act, the FMLA that we currently have, was called the Family Employment Security Act, the FESA, and it was passed in 1984. And it provided up to 26 weeks off for family caregiving. So let's go in the Wayback Machine, about 200 years, from about 1800s to the 1920s, you know, all healthcare was done at home, all caregiving was done at home. Doctors made house calls and caregiving was different then, it was a short duration. You know, you either got better or you died. It didn't, it wasn't a long drawn out process like we have now. And the big public health issues were communicable diseases like the flu and smallpox. And as you can see, life expectancy was pretty short, 40. So over the last 100 years, from like 1920 till the present, um, caregiver responsibilities have increased in a number of ways due to medical advances, shorter hospital stays, increasing lifespans, and better management of chronic illness. The life expectancy has almost doubled. So the first research that was done on caregiving, it's kind of, it was kind of like basic research. They're just trying to figure out what is going on. 
what is up with this whole caregiving situation? <clears throat> Excuse me. And you'll see this in the, you'll see how the titles of these projects evolve. These are all research studies. They're articles basically. And you can see this one from 1979, 1978. This one's from 1980. What I did, where I got these was from PubMed. It's a website. It's a free public website that anybody can go on and search for medical research articles. And that's what I did. I went in there and I searched for family caregiving, 1970 to 1980. And this is a, some of what came up. You can see that the titles are very basic. Caregivers, that's the title of the study. The next one, effects of illness on the family. Formal and formal informal, formal and informal care. Discontinu discontinuities in a continuum. <clears throat> so basically they're just gathering information. It's kind of like basic, basic research. That's 1970, 1980. 80s and the 90s, you can see they're starting to get a little more complex. They're looking at caregiver stress and coping. And look at these titles. Caregiving demands and appraisals of stress among family caregivers. Sources of stress among families caring for relatives with Alzheimer's. Family caregiving to dependent older adults, stress, appraisal, and coping. They also, in the 80s and 90s, started looking at the effects of caregiving on the family. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So hopefully you took the time while I was taking that break to read through these titles. <laughs> and you can see that increasing complexity. I'm gonna read one for you. Theoretical questions and ethical issues in a family caregiving relationship. And I'm gonna move on. So we move into the year 2000, like 2000 to 2010. We started looking closer and closer at caregiving. New issues began to emerge. For example, medical advances. We started to have a better understanding and treatment of cognitive disorders, for example, like Alzheimer's and dementia. And this led to quicker stabilization of patients, quicker discharge, and more healing and recovery at home. Economics. People are being discharged sooner with less discharge planning. Many chronic illnesses we now can live with for a long, long time. And technology always expanding. Right now, you know, the big thing is uh, real-time monitoring. You know, you can video with your, you can tell a tele doc with your doctor, but now they're looking at, you know, real-time monitoring of like your physical data too, which is pretty amazing. Ah, excuse me. So I just threw in some titles since I'm so uh, fun of that in this presentation, again, showing the complexity, 2000, 2010, family caregiver strains, comparative analysis of cancer caregiving with dementia, diabetes, and frail, frail elderly caregiving. <coughs> Here's, I like this one, family caregiving for immigrant seniors living with heart disease and stroke, Chinese Canadian perspective. That's pretty detailed and that's pretty like creative and complex, I think. Anyway, that's 2000, 2010. Currently, 2020, the NIH budget for caregiving research was 158 million. That's impressive. And research topics included economic and financial impacts of caregiving, health and well being of caregivers, differences in age gender relationships and socioeconomic status of caregivers, specific diseases or disabilities, not just the, for the care recipient, but also within the caregiver population. Effectiveness of caregiver interventions. Now, not just the effectiveness of, of interventions for the care recipient, but now for the caregiver. And also health outcomes for the caregiver. So these are things that are being looked at now. 
And um, these are funded caregiver research study titles. I couldn't get the whole citation because they weren't done yet. This was just from the funding, the NIH funding website that gave the titles they had funded for 219. And I just wanted to throw some out because they're really cool. Brain View, a novel EEG system for using anywhere by non-EEG caregivers. They're developing EEG machines that the public can use at home. I mean, pretty soon in a couple of years, we're gonna be doing surgery on the kitchen table. You know, this is how advanced we're getting. Home-based primary care for homebound seniors. They're talking about doing home visits again, home-based primary care. This is great. The potential for music to improve the quality of life in dementia caregiving relationships. I think it's great that we're looking at such a beautifully aesthetic like music, how that could be a treatment. Wouldn't that be wonderful? A binational study of the dementia trajectory and living arrangements in the US and Mexico. International comparisons. I mean, just the scale is really getting very large. And stress resilience and aging in Alzheimer's disease and dementia caregivers. I just threw it in there because I'm a big fan of resilience. But again, looking at very detailed, complex situations with the caregiver. So they've really come a long way since 1978. And this is some research outcome data from AARP. It's a nice little graphic they did. This is caregiving in the US 2020. I'm just gonna read through some of this with you. I can tell you right now, nothing has decreased. This only increases. We've got about 10 million more people since 215 are taking care of a family member in the home. That's uh, 2 million people a year increase. It's gone up from 18% to 21. More Americans are caring for more than one person and went from 18 to 24%. More family caregivers have difficulty coordinating care. That went from 19 to 26%. These increases are huge, absolutely huge. More Americans caring for someone with Alzheimer's from 22 to 26. More family caregivers report their own health is fair to poor, 17 to 21. Oops, and who are we? 60% women, 40% men, 60% of the caregivers are working. Like I said, none of that has decreased. It's pretty significant increases if you ask me. So with that said, Let's just move into how you can participate in caregiving research. You can, car you can participate as a consumer. For example, the Family Caregiver Alliance has a wonderful article on their website about how to evaluate, how to read medical research studies and clinical trial studies, how to make sense of all those big medical words they use, how to read the tables. And then PubMed, I think I mentioned before, PubMed is an NIH funded registry of peer reviewed biomedical and life sciences literature. It goes back as far as possible. Uh, and that's where I got all the titles, all the research that was mentioned here came from PubMed and I included the, the link there. And you can go there and search and you can go and read how to evaluate medical research and you can go and, and read your own. Another way you can participate is as a participant. You can check the registries. The Family Caregiver Alliance has a registry, a research registry on their website and clinicaltrials.gov has a clinical trials registry um, as well. Uh, I can tell you that if anybody from St. Barnabas or from the Family Caregiver Support Program ever asks you to take a survey or a pre or post test, please do because we, were, we will be collecting that data in order to approve our program and to see if we are actually helping you. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you for your participation today. But before I leave, there's one other thing I'd like to share with you. It's very exciting. Addition to the St. Barnabas Senior Services, we are now offering savvy caregiver classes in partnership with the USC Edward R. Roybal Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's Los Angeles. These classes teach you more about helping a loved one with memory loss, cognitive impairment, or dementia. And I know my clients that have gone through this class, pretty much what they have to say is they wish they would have gone through it sooner because it has helped them to help their loved one 
that has memory loss, cognitive impairment, or dementia. Uh, significantly. They've been able to help them significantly better. So if you're interested in learning about the Savvy Caregiver classes at St. Barnabas, you can call St. Barnabas or you can check our website. So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you for participating today.